Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this lovely day that you have given us. Thank you for the opportunity to be together, to fellowship, to sit under your words. Father, um, remind us always that every page of Scripture is a path to your Son that either prepares us for him or promises him or shows us our need for him. It's in his name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to be in 1 Samuel 20. Um, we covered the last two verses of 1 Samuel 19 last week. <laughs> Moving right along. So to kind of remind you of where we are at, it seems like ever since David slew Goliath, his days of peace have been numbered. Psalm 27, 1, David would later write these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But that is not where David is in 1 Samuel 20. In 1 Samuel 20, David is afraid. Beginning with verse 1, Then David fled from Nioth and Ramah. Now what is the deal with Nioth and Ramah? Where is, where, what's, the, what's been going on there? Yeah, that's where Samuel and the, the company of prophets is camped out. And of course, Saul had been sending messengers, been sending spies to try to capture David so they could bring him back to Saul and kill him. Every time they'd go into the camp, the Holy Spirit would come on them. They'd start prophesying. So Saul finally says, okay, I'm going to go there myself. And then the Holy Spirit really does a number on him. And he ends up uh, naked and ranting at uh, Samuel's feet. And we talked about that at length last week, that this is a sign from heaven that really, really is underscoring, Saul, you have lost the kingdom. So verse 1, David fled from Nioth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is my guilt and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? I'm going to pause right here. Let's talk about David's bad. He has fled from the presence of Samuel and the company of prophets. Now, what did I say that that represents in this story? The church. David made the mistake that we have seen so many make and maybe have perhaps even made ourselves. When times of trouble and weakness come, they run away from the church. They run away from God's people. It, it, that's, it's fascinating because David, if you look, he was, he was protected by God in the camp, wasn't he? Every time someone came seeking his life, God had prevented it. So that's David's bad. Now here's David's good. Who does he go and seek out? Jonathan, who is a trusted fellow man of faith. So he seeks out Jonathan for help in his trouble. What do you guys uh, think about that? The, the bad and the good. Have you, ever, have you ever had that moment, uh, that time in your life where you fled from the church? I 
I have. You know, when um, a lot of you guys might know this, some of you might not. I, in my late 20s, I worked for an inner city ministry in Memphis for two years. And what I did not know when I, when I joined up was that they were falling to pieces. Now, I was in grad school full time and I was uh, just supposed to be apprenticing with that ministry. And the next thing I knew, I was working 60, 70 hours a week on top of going to class and trying to keep up with things. Um, of course, doing urban ministry, you see and experience a lot of very emotionally heavy, traumatic stuff. Um, and when I left Memphis, I was so burned out, depressed, kind of, kind of me and God weren't getting along real well, that I ended up not, not being in church for like nine months. And when I finally came back, to the church that I'd been a member of for years um, before I went to Memphis. I remember telling the guys who would get people to lead singing and read scriptures and do, commu you know, that kind of thing. I remember telling them, don't ask me to do anything. I'm just here. Now that, thankfully, that didn't, that didn't last a long time, but that's, that's one of my stories. That's not the only time that, that, ever, that I ever, in my disillusionment, ran away. But that's the most recent time that's happened. Mike? Mm-hmm. And share that with somebody. Uh, once I did that, so I see this. Right. Oh, it, it, you're right, and, but it also it shows this thing with Dave and Jonathan that the that the 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 bonds of the Holy Spirit can be stronger and thicker than blood. Um, quick sidebar question: Is anybody else hot? I forgot to turn the ceiling fans on this morning. Pollard, can you? I'm sorry if you can take care of that for me, since you know where those, those deals are. I just realized, and I'm like, man, I'm hot. And then I looked, and I'm like, oh, the ceiling fans aren't on. But yeah, no, Mike, I th it, that that shows the importance of having two those those trusted spiritual, you know, Christian kind of friendships, because it, it, the story of David and Jonathan really does, like I said, prove that the, the that the the ties that bind us in the Holy Spirit are even stronger than blood, because Jonathan is loyal to David.
All right, we're getting a little too far ahead of ourselves. We haven't got there yet. You should have said spoiler alert. Verses 2 through 4. So David's afraid. He runs from the camp of the prophets. He comes to Jonathan. And he's like, what, what, what is up with this? Why does your dad keep trying to kill me? Jonathan's reply, verse 2, and he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing either great or small without disclosing it to me. And, and why would my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives... And as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. Jonathan, you can see here, there's a, there's a struggle going on in Jonathan because he still hasn't fully, even though he's had to, he knows his dad has thrown spears at David multiple times. He knows he's had to talk his father down from executing David for no good reason one time. But for some reason, he still has not fully reconciled himself to this idea that his father has gone completely crazy and cannot be reasoned with, right? I think Jonathan, Jonathan still thinks, hey, I can smooth this out with dad, right? So what David does in that moment is really cool, too, because he gives Jonathan a reality pill, you know. And, and to his, his credit, Jonathan listens and agrees to help David. And it's really interesting, too, because he says, whatever you say, I will do for you. How often do people, or have you seen this happen, where people come... And they're hurting and they have a need. And someone else tries to set the terms for how they're going to help them. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Like someone says, oh, you know, I, I'm really hurting with this. This is really a bad situation. And I, I, I need this from you. And the other, the other person says, well... You know, I think you really need this. You know, I think this is what needs to happen. You guys ever had a situation like that? And you felt like the person wasn't really listening to what you needed? Was that, Bev? Did you, did you have something to say? No? I thought you, I thought you were saying something. So, Jonathan, to his credit, decides to help David, and he listens and does it. He agrees to, to help David on David's terms, what David needs. Right? He says, whatever you say, I will do for you. So, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it does have to be tempered, I think, by the relationship. And and that because that's one of the things I think um, that there are situations where 
someone is, is um, let me make a distinction here. I think this is a good distinction to make. When the struggle that the person is coming to you with is, say, a sin issue that they don't want to, they don't, they don't want to give up. I think that's a that's a time where you have to put down biblical boundaries, right? But when someone is coming to you with an actual hurt or trauma. And that's the situation David is in, right? In this in this situation, that's a little that's a little different. Where you want to be more accommodating to to them, because if they don't feel like they can trust you, and it, as the relationship develops, if you're if you see something where they need to make this change or make that change, you kind of in in, in how you re- responded at first, you kind of earn the right to speak into that. Um, if David was in the wrong in this situation, here's the deal: Jonathan, if anybody has earned the right to give him the business about it, but in this situation, that's not the same. So I think that's a that's a case by case situation. But you're right, Jerry. There are times that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree in a situation like that, most definitely. Right. And I think I think you're yeah, I think that's another definite um that's a qualifier that you both have a healthy relationship with God because that that kind of changes the dynamic. Well, no, I mean, I, here, here's what, here's, no, here's what I think, I, it, it, I think it depends. I think there are a lot of situations where, um, I mean, you can have a healthy relationship with God and your life still fall to pieces, you know, um, and, uh, you can you can have a healthy relationship with God and still even fall into grievous sin. What David is going to be a prime example of that. Um, so that's kind of a that's almost like a different level discussion. What I think what imp- what impresses me here is that Jonathan who is so okay let me let me give you an example and I'm not going to name any names and this is not a church that's anywhere around here okay I had a friend who was a preacher at a church and the the daughter-in-law of one of the elders came to my friend who is a preacher and his wife and suddenly spilled the truth about years of abuse in their marriage. So what the preacher did was of course he confronted the man, and he let the elders know, including that man's father. The way that the eldership responded was to fire him for telling the truth. 
and the 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 elder who was the father of the the young man who was abusing his wife said you bet on the wrong horse It would be really easy in a situation like this for Jonathan to side with his father because he doesn't want to rock the boat. But we see his character on display. And he says to David, and that's my, my friend who was the preacher in that situation, and his wife, they said to that young lady, we will do whatever you and your kids need to support you. This is the, that, I think that parallels better the situation um, that I'm kind of getting at here because things don't always get handled that um, with that much character. Uh, Kathy, in a minute, can I get you to read a scripture for me? It'll, it, we're going to go, it'll be um, 1 Samuel 18, verse 3. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read <clears throat> 1 Samuel 20, I'm going to go verses 5 through 11 here to give you a flavor of how the story is going to unfold. This is the part that might kind of, kind of let a spoiler out on, I think, a little bit. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at the table with the king. Um, what's the significance of the new moon? What did what did what was one of the one of the kind of special days for ancient Israelites? The new moon festival. And of course in the royal palace that would be a special occasion. So he said, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at the table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there with all the clan. If he says, Good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that harm is determined by him. So this is David's plan here, right? Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, far be it from me, or far be it from you, if I knew that it was determined by my father that harm should come to you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers roughly? And Jonathan said to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. I want to look at verse 8. David is referring back to when he says... Um, in verse 8, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Kathy, read 1 Samuel 18, verse 3. Okay. Jonathan had made a covenant of loyalty with David, meaning that he had sworn in the name of the Lord... In this passage that Kathy read, he had sworn in the name of the Lord to protect and to be faithful and loyal to David. So in this moment where tensions are very high, right? And David is asking Jonathan to do something that's sneaky and that's in defiance of Saul, Jonathan's father, David reminds Jonathan what? You made a covenant with me. You swore before me and the Lord to be faithful and loyal to me and to protect me. 
So he reminds Jonathan of their covenant, but he also says, if I'm guilty and you know it, kill me now. <laughs> um, he's like, you know, if, if, I, if I deserve to be treated this way, you do it. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't, don't let your father do it. Don't let him gloat over me. But the reason he's doing this is to emphasize his own innocence because David knows that he has not done anything to provoke this in Saul. So he's saying to Jonathan, look, if I deserve this, kill me now. Of course, Jonathan's going to go, well, no, of course you don't deserve all this treatment. I, this is interesting too, verse 11. And Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out into the field. And so they both went out into the field. Does this remind you of another story in the Bible? You got these two guys and one says to the other, come, let us go out into the field. Cain and Abel, yes. Cain and Abel. Remember, Cain is angry at his brother. And one day he says, what? Come, let us go out into the field. And what does he do in the field? So the fact, no, that, that Jonathan says this, and David, this is once again where in the Bible you see these phrases and story arcs and stuff, and they kind of come back up. David says, come, let us, David's just said, if I'm guilty, kill me now. Jonathan's response is, hey, let's go to the field. David willingly follows him. What is that showing about David and Jonathan in that moment? Yes, they trust each other. There's not going to be a Cain and Abel moment. Yeah, see, God does that on purpose. This is one of the ways, you know, Scripture is inspired. Because the same things kind of loop around a lot. Oscar? Uh huh. You know, I've never thought about how Christ is involved in the new moon harvest. I know you would think I would have, but I but I haven't. Uh, all the other festivals, I could I could tell you, but that's a good question. Why don't I get Why don't I get back to you on that, Oscar? If you could text me sometime this week and remind me, too, that would be great. Okay. Because that, that is a good question. Um, I mean, my, my assumption is that the New Moon Festival is... I mean, you're, you're basically thanking God for protecting you. It's, it, new Moon means new month. in Because in, the, the, the Hebrews were on a lunar calendar. So you're kind, of, you're kind of thanking God for providing and protecting you for another month, and you're looking forward to his continued provision and protection. But, uh, yeah, Oscar, that's a great question. Like I said, it's, it's really funny because, like, Passover, Day of Atonement, uh, you know, I could tell you... Um, how this is going to be fulfilled because Jesus, one of the things, if you're ever reading the book of John, Jesus shows up at all the festivals and that's to show you how he's the fulfillment of the festivals. But I don't remember a new moon. So I, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that for you. Let's go ahead. Thanks for asking that though. That's a really good question. Let's go ahead and look at, uh, pick up again at uh, verses 12 through 17. And Jonathan said to David, so they're, they've gone out to the field now, right? And Jonathan said to David, the Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. So once again, what is Jonathan doing here? The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness, he says to David. What does he want? He's renewing his covenant, or he's at least, right, remembering the basis of that covenant that he has already sworn 
to the Lord that he's going to be loyal to David. He's sworn with a sacred oath. So he says again, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day. Behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. This phrase, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, what does that mean? He's saying, if, if I hear that my father intends to do you harm and I don't warn you, may the harm that he intends to do to you fall on me and even worse. So that's, that's part of the vow that he's making before the Lord to David. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father if I am still alive show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die and do not cut off your steadfast love for my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth and Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David so that this is a new new covenant he's making with David saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his own love for him, for he loved him as his own soul. So, there's a lot going on right there. Jonathan in 1 Samuel 18, 3, made a covenant with David to be faithful and loyal to him. Now he's, he's built on that covenant, right? He's reaffirmed that he's built more. But what, what do we see David doing in return? And Jonathan asking in return and David doing. David is also reciprocating and making a covenant of loyalty to Jonathan. Listen to this. This is the, the, the middle here of verse 13, really the end of it. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die and do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the earth. What is Jonathan fully recognize here and accept yeah that day not only that but that David is going to be the next king not Jonathan and 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 Jonathan is saying David when you come into your kingdom and you have to and, and it, this is just political reality my friends you have to kill everybody who's still loyal to Saul remember me if I'm still alive remember my household and the fact that we were always loyal to you David is going to keep his covenant with Jonathan on that years later we are not there yet but do you do you guys remember the story how David ends up fulfilling his covenant with Jonathan there Mephibosheth yes Jonathan had a young son who when the when the when the battle was happening and those who were loyal to Saul were being killed 
Mephibosheth's nanny, his nurse, he was about four or five years old, picked him up and in a hurry, she was trying to run away and get to safety and she accidentally dropped him and it broke both of his legs and he was crippled, he was lame from the time he was a child. And David later on is going to ask, is there anyone left from Jonathan's family, this is Jonathan's son Mephibosheth, that I can show favor to because of this covenant that I made with Jonathan? And they said he's got this one son out in the boonies named Mephibosheth who's been lame from the time of his youth. And David brings Mephibosheth to come live in the royal property and come have dinner at his table every night. And we'll get into that later because that's, that's an interesting story and it takes some fun twists and turns. But we know David, he makes this, his own covenant of loyalty with Jonathan and he keeps it. And he keeps it. You guys feel the emotional heaviness of this moment. Jonathan is accepting his fate, whatever it is. He seems to have a premonition that what's going to happen to Jonathan. Yeah. Because he says, if I am alive. Show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. Right? When the, when the dust settles, if I'm still alive, don't you remember this covenant of loyalty we have between us. Don't take me out. Verses 18 to 23. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself when the matter was in hand, and remain beside the stone heap. So Jonathan, it, basically what he's saying is, David, I know, I know where your, hot, your favorite hideout spots are, Right? So this one, this heap of rocks you like to hide out at, that's where we're going to meet. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of the heap, as though I shot um, at a mark. And behold, I will send the young man, saying, go find the arrows. If I say to the young man, look, the arrows are on this side of you, take them. Then you are to come, for as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no danger. But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. This phrase, the Lord is between you and me forever, what Jonathan is saying is David, my love and devotion to you is undying and it is our mutual faith in the Lord that's going to back up this covenant of loyalty between us. I'm not saying, certainly, 
that you that every everyone in the church should have a David and Jonathan relationship with each other. We we don't have the capacity to have that many best friends, right? Especially not when you're an introvert like me. However, there is something to be said about the fact that there is a covenant that binds us together that is a covenant from the Lord. That is stronger than any petty grievances that we might have or disagreements or just the fact that we can get on each other's everlasting loving nerve. Do you guys know what the significance is of a covenant in Scripture? Because I'm using that word a lot. The store uses that word a lot, right? Why is a covenant such a big deal? A covenant is an agreement between two or more parties in Scripture that is under sanctions. What does under sanctions mean? God's authority is behind it, but also if you, if you keep if you keep the covenant, you are blessed. If you do not keep the covenant, you are cursed. Yes, very much so. Thank you. I want to share my favorite my, one of my favorite biblical covenants with you guys because this is the one that Christ ultimately fulfilled. Really, all of God's covenants are fulfilled in Christ, but this is the biggie that I'm talking about for us as believers that unites us. This is, and you don't, you don't have to go there if you don't want to, but this Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, why is it significant that that Abraham is still called Abram in Genesis 15? Remember, God changed his name. Abraham means that what? He's going to be the father of many. Abraham has not had the child of promise yet, and he's getting old. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number him. Then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him, as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? 
And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And Abram brought him all of these and cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. So this is the picture. Abraham is saying what to God? Abraham is, he's believing God, right? He believes God and God credits to him his righteousness, but he's having a crisis. Why? Right, and God had made the promise, you will have many descendants and through you will come the one Right? Who will bless all nations. Now, who is that one? Christ. Abram is getting very old and he's saying, God, I still... And Sarah is getting very old and he's saying, God, where is this child that you promised? Where are these offspring who are going to possess the earth that you promised? Where is this blessing for all the nations that you promised? And God says, no, no, no. Now, you, you listen here. Now, we, we, we don't get to see the stars very much because we have all the city lights. But on a clear night at Sierra Bible Camp or somewhere like that, how many stars can you see? You can't count them, can you? And God says, That's, your offspring is going to be like that. And this is the covenant that God cuts with Abraham. And the, the, what he does is he tells Abraham, now you take these animals, right? And you cut them in half and you, you set them kind of apart from each other. They're like a path, right? You're imagining all these animals who've been cut in half and there's a path between them. And the, the, the buzzards and the vultures and stuff keep trying to get at them. And Abraham does what? chases him off verse 12 and as the sun was going down a deep sleep fell on abram and behold a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him then the lord said to abram know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years but i will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions as for you yourself, you will go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, this is the really important thing with this covenant, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. You have smoke and you have fire coming between the animals that have been slaughtered. Where else do you see smoke and fire? Yeah, what, what follows Israel and protects them? The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, I've said this before, you might remember this. Anytime you see any visible manifestation of God in the Old Testament, who is that actually? It's Jesus. Jesus is the person of the Trinity who manifests himself visibly. So who is this smoke and fire, this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire walking between the slaughtered animals of the covenant here? Jesus. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the land of the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and all these other Canaanite peoples. Yeah, all those ites. This is a covenant. Now, what is the symbolism of Christ passing between the slaughtered animals? 
Jonathan says to David, may the Lord do so to me and worse if I do not fulfill my covenant to you. Christ is saying, he's, and this is, this is the one time, there's, no, there's nothing Abraham has to do in this covenant. That's what makes this one special. Right? It's all on God. It's all on Christ. But yes, the fact that Abram, because usually when you would, because the actual Hebrew term is that you cut a covenant. It doesn't just say make a covenant. It says you cut a covenant. Because like we saw right here, right? You, he literally cut the pieces and, and you, you would walk between the slaughtered animals with the person you were making a covenant with. That's one way of doing it. Okay? Abram does not walk through. He's, right, he's, he's in a trance. He's, he's knocked out. He's gone. Abram doesn't walk through the slaughtered animals. Christ does. He's saying, on my life, in my blood, I promise to fulfill this, uh, the promises that I've made to you. And Christ ultimately does do that. That is the covenant that binds every believer together. Christ's love, Christ's blood, Christ's life. We'll pick up at verse 24 next week. You are now free to wander about the cabin.